everybody. We're talking about how Texas and other states are under a military occupation. Um, well, uh, first of all, you got to understand, or most people know about the Civil War, and it was an undeclared war, and there was no peace treaty. Um, this is the law of customs, uh, uh, law and customs of war on land. That's Hague Convention number four, and and it's Article Forty Two. Uh, territory is considered occupied when it's actually placed under the authority of the hostile army. The occupation extends only to the territory where such authority has been established and can be exercised. Uh, this is Article 2 of the Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilians in the time of war of 1949. And um, the, um, in addition to the provisions which shall be implemented in peacetime, the present convention shall apply to all cases of declared war or of any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. The convention shall also apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party, even if the said occupation meets with no armed resistance. Although one of the powers in the conflict may not be a party to the present convention, the powers who are parties thereto shall remain bound by it in their mutual relations. They shall furthermore be bound by the convention in relation to the said power, if the latter accepts and applies the provisions thereof. So, um, anyways, the point is is that uh, it's talking about military occupation. This is Article 1 of the Liber Code. Uh, the, a place, district, or country occupied by an enemy stands in consequence of the occupation under martial law of the invading or occupying army. Whether any proclamation declaring martial law or any public warning to the inhabitants has been issued or not, Martial law is the immediate and direct effect and consequence of occupation or conquest. The presence of a hostile army proclaims its martial law. Okay, that's exactly the way it works. And this Article 2 of the Libra Code, martial law does not cease during the hostile occupation except by special proclamation ordered by the Commander-in-Chief or by special mention in the Treaty of Peace concluding the war. When the occupation of a place or territory continues beyond the conclusion of peace as one of the conditions of the same. So there's either got to be a proclamation or it's got to be mentioned in the Treaty of Peace. Otherwise, it doesn't end. Despite the fact that the southern states have been functioning peacefully for two years and had been uh, counted to secure ratification of the 13th Amendment, Congress passed the Reconstruction Act. March 2nd, 1867, which provided for the military occupation of 10 of the 11 southern states. It, included tennis, it excluded Tennessee from the military occupation, and one must suspect it was because Tennessee had ratified the 14th Amendment on July 7th, 1866. And this is actually taken from a book called The Non-Ratification of the 14th Amendment by Judge A.H. Ellett of the Utah Supreme Court, and this is associated with the case Diet versus Turner. Um, and now we'll do a little advertisement. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Don't forget to click the bell next to the subscribe button so you're notified when there's a new upload. Um, um, and uh, here is the channel. And you see the arrow pointing to the bell. You, point, you click that bell and, uh, and you can subscribe. Then, uh, and uh, this is um, the non-ratification of the 14th Amendment by Judge H. Ellett again, um, in the case uh, um, Diet versus Turner. And this is uh, in, actually in the area where they're talking about the uh, Libra Code. And he says, note, there is no treaty of peace between the Union and the several states that is known of and the end of full martial law was finally declared by withdrawal of troops and streets, but repeal of all forms of the law martial has never been declared. So there's no treaty of peace, and there's no uh, proclamation. And um, so, um, whoops. Uh, and there's another note. Um, under the law marshal, only the criminal jurisdiction of a military court is recognized. But as Article 3 says, 
the civil courts can continue wholly or in part as long as the civil jurisdiction does not violate the military orders laid down by the commander-in-chief or one of his commanders, or one of his commanders. By this means, a military venue, jurisdiction, and authority are imposed upon the occupied populace under disguise of the ordinary civil courts and officers of the occupied district or region, because the so-called civil authorities in an occupied district or region only act at the pleasure of a military authority. It should also be noted here that the several state legislatures, county boards of commissioners, and city councils are constantly legislating to please the edicts of the federal government, which is the occupying force, and that their legislation in this sense is not an exercise of state sovereignty, but instead a compliance with edicts of the military force which occupies the several states and consequently are edicts of martial law rule. And that's again taken from the book Non-Ratification of the 14th Amendment by Judge H. Ellett, the Utah Supreme Court, in the case Diet versus Turner. So uh, we're under martial law. There's three kinds of martial law. There's full martial law, which is military, which is troops on the street. Martial law proper, which is the law of the armed forces, where a captain tells a private what to do. And martial law rule, where um, it's not as obvious, but it's very insidious and is still going on. Um, the law of emergency and the law of necessity. And that's all found in uh, in uh, that uh, diet uh, in that uh, non-ratification of the Fourteenth Amendment by Judge H. Ellett of the Utah Supreme Court uh, in the case Diet versus Turner, and it's also found in Ex Parte Milligan, uh, which is a U.S. Supreme Court case, Civil War era, um, and the the site and where it's located is there. This is the Revised Code of Washington, Legislative Declaration of Civil Liberties Day of Remembrance. The legislature recognizes that on February 19, 1942, the President of the United States issued Executive Order 9066, which authorized military rule over civilian law and lives. So what's the evidence of martial law, of a military occupation? Well, military script is circulated for money, first of all, that's Federal Reserve notes. Police use a rank structure of captain, lieutenant, and sergeant. Um, police refer to uh, um, anybody that's not in the military as civilians. Courts presume everything. Everything's under presumption. Curfews is, strict, is strictly under martial law jurisdiction. And that doesn't happen too often, but if it does, um, it's martial law. Uh, state and regional areas under metro government provide for military venue for the peace officers to enforce the martial law jurisdiction. And, uh, and that's like metro police, you know, like Dallas metro police that covers a whole bunch of cities. Uh, bar members who are United Nations foreign agents are officers of the court. This is a case, Amanda Sykes versus State of Texas, uh, Court of Appeals of Texas, 3rd District. And, uh, and the overview is all I wanted to talk about here. Um, it says the defendant confessed to shooting her husband accidentally. Defendant argued that her conviction was void because the public officials responsible for investigating and prosecuting her case failed to qualify for their offices. The appellate court ruled that the failure of the officers and the prosecuting attorneys to properly qualify for their offices did not render their acts void because each established de facto authority to exercise the power of their office or appointment. There was evidence in the record that each officer was acting under the color of authority and had a reputation in the community as a law enforcement officer. Similarly, the prosecuting attorney testified she had held her offices for, for some time and had a reputation in the community as a prosecuting attorney. Furthermore, because the record indicated that the county no longer used a jury wheel, the trial court did not err in ordering the sheriff to summon additional potential jurors. Okay, so this is all evidence of martial law rule. It's a de facto court. And now a little advertisement announcing a subscription-based YouTube channel called Sovereignty International. The recommended cost of the subscription is currently $1.99 a month because it avoids the advertising only. When I originally uh, wanted to do this uh, YouTube channel, I was thinking about having some exclusive content. But um, I can't think of anything uh, that I want to have exclusive yet. Um, the only power that these New World Order Satanists have over us is through fraud and deception, and my agenda is to expose it all. 
so um i can't think of anything that i would have on there exclusive i'm not saying that it won't eventually be exclusive material on there but the only real advantage is that you don't get any advertising so i'm currently publishing six videos a week and the uh, the link people have said they can't find the channel so uh, there's a link right there at the bottom on the very bottom of this um this is the channel and uh, also that's another thing is people have sent me uh, donations uh, to uh, to uh, PayPal and um, and I think it was because it was a dollar ninety nine <laughs> I think it was for the purposes of this uh, 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 channel and so uh, the only way you can do it is by uh, clicking on that start free trial link on the uh, on the YouTube uh, channel and and actually uh, the link again is uh, up at the top in the blue where the top arrow is at. Uh, back to the original topic at hand, um, Article 6, Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilians in a time of war of 1949. So uh, uh, Texas is under military occupation, and this, uh, what this Article 6 says, the present convention shall apply from the outset of any conflict or op op occupation mentioned in Article 2. In the territory of parties to the conflict, the application of the present convention shall cease on the general close of military operations. In the case of occupied territory, the application of the present convention shall cease one year after the general close of military occupations. However, the occupying power shall be bound for the duration of the occupation to the extent that such power exercises the function of government in such territory by the provisions of the following articles of the present convention. And so, so even throughout the uh, uh, occupation, they still have to, there are certain articles of this uh, Geneva Convention uh, that they have to uh, comply with. So we're going to go through some of those. Some of them you're going to see it's obvious what's going on. And some of them uh, are um, ways that we could bring civil litigation. This is Article 27. Protected persons are entitled in all circumstances to respect for their persons, their honor, their family rights, their religious convictions and practices, and their manners and customs. They shall at all times be humanely treated and shall be protected, especially against all acts of violence or threats thereof and against insults and public curiosity. Women shall be especially protected against any attack on their honor, in particular against rape and forced prostitution or any form of indecent assault. Without prejudice to the provisions relating to their state of health, age, and sex, all protected persons shall be treated with the same consideration by the party to the conflict in whose power they are, without any adverse distinction based in particular on race, religion, or political opinion. However, the parties to the conflict may take such measures of control and security in regard to protected persons as may be necessary as a result of the war. Um, and this is Article 33. You can see that stuff in Article 27 is all put in statutes, actually. Uh, no protected person may be punished for an offense he or she has not personally committed. Collective penalties and likewise all measures of intimidation or of terrorism are prohibited. Well, and so this is grounds for, uh, for civil litigation because they're engaging in terrorism. Pillage is prohibited, and that's another grounds for civil litigation. Anytime they steal your property, that's pillage. Uh, reprisals against protected persons and their property are prohibited. And so that's Article 33. So there's some grounds for civil litigation, depending on what happens and, and in your particular case. The occupying power may not compel protected persons to serve in its armed or auxiliary forces. No pressure or propaganda which aims at securing voluntary enlistment is permitted. And that's Article 51. Now, this is why the Selective Service Registration Form describes people in the District of Columbia and the territories. If you read it and look at all the little stars and asterisks and, uh, and then look at the fine print, the real fine print, you'll see that, that, that uh, there's nobody, uh, the only people that are um, required to register for the Selective Service are people in the District of Columbia and the territories. See, see my do-it-yourself how not to volunteer for the Selective Service in the draft video. Um, this is Article 52. No contract, agreement, or regulation shall impair the right of any worker, well, of, uh, whether voluntary or not, and wherever he may be, to apply to the representatives of the protecting power in order to request the said power's intervention. Okay, so, um, in other words, that sounds like filing fees in courts. Okay, they're, they're basically selling their justice. 
All measures aiming at creating unemployment or at restricting the opportunities offered to workers in an occupied territory in order to induce them to work for the occupying power are prohibited, and, uh, and they're certainly doing that. There's all sorts of jobs where they say U.S. citizens only. And, um, and, and that kind of stuff. And that's all, that's all falls under this Article 2 of the Geneva Convention. Um, Article 66, uh, in case of a breach of the penal provisions promulgated by it by virtue of the second article of Article 64, the occupying power may hand over the accused to its properly constituted non-political military courts on condition said courts sit in the occupied country. Courts of appeal may uh, shall preferably sit in the occupied country. So, um, again, the, the part I wanted to stress is non-political military courts. They're all military. They're all, you see those bail priest uniform they're wearing, those black robes? That's military uniform. And they're supposed to be non-political, and, um, and yet they're bought and paid for. And, and we're going to go through stuff that shows that. And the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 1, Clause 3, it talks about these occupied territories. It says the state parties to the present covenant, including those having responsibility for the administration of non-self-governing and trust territories. Okay, well, that's an occupation. Think about it. This is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 14, Clause 1. All persons shall be equal before the courts and tribunals in the determination of any criminal charge of, against him or of his rights and obligations in a suit at law Okay, so they're talking civil and criminal procedures. Uh, everyone shall be entitled to a, a fair and public hearing by competent, independent, impartial tribunal established by law. And um, so uh, this is, um, um, there's no common law offenses in the United States, only those acts which Congress has forbidden with penalties for disobedience of its commands or crimes. And this is evidence of martial law. Okay, if there's no common law crimes, then you're under martial law. Uh, in Texas, the same thing, okay? There's no common law crimes, then you're under martial law. Under Texas law, no act or omission is a crime unless made so by statute. The legislature may create an offense in the same enactment, provide exceptions to its application. Okay, so if you're not, um, um, if you're under martial law, then they eliminate common law. And what they do to maintain the illusion is they go and pass statutes that say that common law, they put all this legal jargon in there, where to force and here force and all this other stuff. And, um, and, uh, and, but they basically say that common law is the rule of decision, okay? And they've done that in Texas and every state. They have to make a statute because under martial law, there are no crimes unless they pass a statute uh, to make it a crime. And uh, so that's the evidence of the martial law. They make statutes making for, uh, murder, treason, sedition, assault, theft, crimes, okay? Those are all common law crimes. And, uh, and they have to pass a statute that makes it a crime. <laughs> Under common law, there are already crimes, but there's no common law. That's why they put in statutes and constitutions statements about common law. That's why statutes and constitutions only apply to a belligerence, which are U.S. citizens and resident aliens. A penal action is an action on a penal statute, an action for recovery of penalty given by statute. Uh, where an action is founded entirely upon a statute, the only object of it is to recover a penalty or a forfeiture. Such action is a penal action. So uh, statutes equal penalty. Okay, any, any penalty is a statute. Okay, so then any statute will have a penalty. And, and, and it comes down to a breach of contract. And, and so then it all goes, you can take it directly to Roman cult law. Um, the words penal and penalty in their strict and primary sense denote a punishment, whether corporal or pecuniary, imposed and enforced by the state for a crime or offense against its laws. The noun penalty is defined forfeiture or to be forfeited for non-compliance with an agreement. <laughs> the words forfeit and penalty are substantially synonymous. A penal action is one founded entirely on statute. The only object is to recover a penalty or forfeiture imposed as a punishment for certain specific offense, okay? And so you're, it's an offense against the contract, okay? While a remedial action is one which is brought to obtain compensation or indemnity. So statutes, all statutes uh, uh, produce penalties, and the penalties are for breach of contract, and it all falls under Roman cult law. Penal action is a civil suit. So there's really no criminal. That's why 
when you get up and you go into the traffic court or one of these kangaroo courts and you say to the clerk masquerading as a judge, you say, uh, so I'd like to know the nature of the cause of that's going on here. And they'll say it's quasi criminal. <laughs> So they're saying that it's uh, civil, really, but, um, but they don't want to tell you that, okay? <laughs> a, a penal action is a civil suit brought for recovery of a statutory forfeiture when inflicted as punishment for an offense against the public. Such actions are civil actions, on the one hand closely related to criminal prosecutions, and on the other hand for private injuries in which the party agreed may by statute recover punitive damages. Uh, this is Tomlin's Law Dictionary, 1835 edition, volume 2, under the definition of Mort Main. Yet still it was found difficult to set bounds to ecclesiastical ingenuity. Gee, that sounds like the Roman cult. For when they were driven out of all their former holds, they devised a new method of conveyance by which the lands were granted not to themselves directly, but to nominal fiafees to the use of the religious houses thus distinguishing between the possession and the use, and receiving the actual profits, while the season of the lands remained in the nominal fiafi, who was held by the courts of equity, then under the direction of the Roman cult, to be bound in con conscience to account for his sestike use for the rents and emoluments of the estate. That sounds like taxes. And so, and the courts of equity are then under the direction of the Roman cult, they're still under the direction of the Roman cult. And it is to these inventions that our practitioners are indebted for the introduction of uses and trusts, the foundation of modern conveyancing. And they were it was the foundation of modern conveyancing in 1835, and it still is to this day. And uh, this is the DC Code, which was approved March 3rd, 1901. Uh, and uh, at uh, 31 Stat 1208, it says that in addition to the jurisdiction conferred in the preceding section, plenary, that's military dictatorship, people, is hereby given to said court holding the special term to hear and determine all questions relative to the execution of any and all wills. Well, isn't that convenient when the, when the uh, and then it goes into 31 Stat 1432 at section uh, 1617, and it says the legal estate to be in the CESTK use. So it's dead things. And so the legal estate is to be in the Sestike use, and they have a, a, a military dictatorship jurisdiction for wills for dead things, and then they can presume you're dead. And this is the uh, uh, same D.C. code uh, uh, located at 31 Stat 1230, Section 252, presumption of death. And so this, this creates the presumption, okay? I know it only says that they, you've got to be gone for seven years and all that stuff. Well, it's, it's all it does is it creates the presumption that you're dead. And uh, because who even keeps track of anybody, whether they're in their house or not in their house? And, um, and uh, so it creates the presumption that you're dead is what it does. And so then they can impose their military dictatorship. And that's even in D.C., okay? A citizen of the United States is a civilly dead entity operating as co-trustee and co-beneficiary of the Public Charitable Trust, the constructive SESTIC Trust of U.S. Inc. under the 14th Amendment, which upholds the debt of USA and U.S. Inc. And this is a summary from the Congressional Record, June 13, 1967, pages 15,641 through 15,646. I get people contacting me all the time wanting to know where this site is. They can't find it in there. Well, it's a summary. I mean, hello. It's, it's, there's, you ever looked at the congressional record? It's extremely fine print. It's three columns. There's a huge amount of stuff on one page, and this is five pages. It's a summary. Every taxpayer is assessed to K trust, having sufficient interest in preventing the abuse of the trust that is to be recognized in the field of the court's prerogative jurisdiction. That's Henry Boland's U.S. citizens fall under the Commerce Clause. Okay, U.S. citizens are, they don't have any rights. A U.S. citizen equals Roman law equals Roman cult. Um, when acting to enforce a statute and its subsequent amendments to the present date, the judge of the municipal court is acting as an administrative officer and not in a judicial capacity. Courts administrating or enforcing statutes do not act judicially, but merely ministerially, but merely act uh, as an extension or agent of the involved agency, but only in a ministerial and not a discretionary capacity. 
In other words, they're bought and paid for. It is the accepted rule, not only in state courts, but of the federal courts as well, that when a judge is enforcing administrative law, they're described as mere extensions of the administrative agency for superior reviewing purposes as a bought and paid for clerk masquerading as a judge. Judges who become involved in enforcement of mere statutes, civil or criminal in nature, and otherwise act as a bought and paid for clerk masquerading as a judge. Where any state proceeds against a private individual in the judicial form, it is well settled that the state, county, municipality, etc. waives any immunity to counters, cross claims, and complaints by direct or collateral means regarding the matters involved. They're bought and paid for. They're operating in their private capacity. It's Roman cult and Roman law. When enforcing mere statutes, judges of all courts do not act judicially and thus are not protected by qualified and limited immunity. They're operating in their private capacity. It's no different than the neighbor coming over and sitting on some show trial. Immunity for judges does not extend to acts which are clearly outside their jurisdiction. A clerk masquerading as judge is not competent to do anything judicial like issue warrant orders or warrants. A clerk masquerading as a judge is operating in his private capacity and has no immunity. Ministerial officers are incompetent to receive grants of judicial power from the legislature. Their acts in attempting to exercise such powers are necessarily nullities. It's a fraud. And now for a little advertisement. Uh, check out my other videos, Bankster Thieves 1, 2, and 3, Churchianity Series, Bankrupt Corporate So-Called Governments, Bar Members 1, 2, and 3, Do It Yourself How Not to Volunteer for the Selected Service of the Draft, Martial Law is here, Do It Yourself No Income Tax, Do It Yourself No Sales Tax, Do It Yourself Traffic Stop 1 and 2, Do It Yourself Free Mail 1 and 2, Do It Yourself Kangaroo Courts 1, 2, 3, and 4. And back to the topic at hand. Kangaroo courts are everywhere. Kangaroo court is a term descriptive of a sham legal proceeding in which a person's rights are totally disregarded and in which the result is a foregone conclusion because of the bias of the court or other tribunal. Um, that's Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition. So you have the judge works for the state, the prosecutor works for the state, the police or witness works for the state. The vast majority of disputes that the police initiate on behalf of the employer are also adjudicated by their employer where the plaintiff, the judge, the antagonist, the police, and the only witness, also the police, all represent the same party. And since no corpus delecti, mens res, or ax reis can be produced, doesn't technically qualify to be heard according to its own laws, the state, therefore, is indistinguishable from a criminal cartel. And see, you see the judge that, that he's wearing his bail priest uniform, and the prosecutor, he's wearing his bail priest uniform, and the cop, he's wearing his Roman cult uniform. So this is all the Roman cult, okay? These are all Satanists. That's why they wear black. It's all Satanism. It's, it's a fraud. It's a nullity. It's deceptive. You have, it's, it's all just a fraud. If they have to get your consent, to obtain jurisdiction if all judges become clerks working for the prosecutor when enforcing any statute. If a clerk masquerading as a judge cannot do anything judicial, then all statutes are color of law. All statutes have to have your consent. All statutes are satanic. They're full of fraud and deception. It's all coming from the Roman cult. A code is even worth less than any statute because they're some liar's opinion of what the statute says. So it's a kangaroo court. That's exactly what it is. It's a kangaroo court. And, and it is noted, this is Williams versus United States, uh, uh, and this is talking about legislative court, only give advisory decisions. These are all legislative courts. It is not as significant that the act constituting the court dispenses with trial by jury, a provision which is distinctly upheld in spite of the Seventh Amendment. With respect to the status of the court, the opinion concludes, while what has been said of the creation of special function of the court definitely reflects his status as a legislative court, there is propriety in mentioning the fact that Congress always has treated it as having that status from the outset, Congress has required it to give merely advisory decisions. 
under the act creating it, all of its decisions were to be of that nature. It is true at the present time a duty to give decisions which are advisory only and so without force of judicial judgments may be laid on a legislative court but not on a constitutional court established under Article 3. I used this case when I went to the Supreme Court recently and one of the questions in the certiary, petition for certiary, is one of the questions I asked was, under what authority does the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit say they have Article Three judges when they can't convene a common law jury? And I use this site as evidence that it is required for an Article Three court to be able to convene a common law jury. And it's a magical thing now because if you go to the U.S. Court for the, uh, of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and, and look at all their, uh, on their website, it doesn't say anything about being an Article Three court or uh, have an Article Three judges. It's a magical thing. Anyways, civil law, Roman law, and Roman civil law are convertible phrases meaning the same system of jurisprudence, that rule of action which every particular nation, commonwealth, or city has established peculiarly for itself, more properly called municipal law. So uh, the point being is that civil law, and think about it, rules of civil procedure, Okay, if you file a lawsuit, you have to follow the rules of civil procedure. I don't care if it's state or federal. And so it's 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 civil law, Roman law, Roman civil law, municipal law are all convertible. Okay, they're all the same thing. You can use any one of those phrases and it means the same thing. So war is business. That's what these Satanists do. The awkward moment when you realize the same government that's supposed to protect us from terrorists is the terrorist. If you think this is for your protection, you clearly have no idea what's going on. Can you spot the terrorists? I can. Terrorism, a noun of use of violence and intimidation in the pursuit of political aims. Uh, and there's the biggest terrorist of them all, surrounded by terrorists. Warning, this is the standing army you were told not to tolerate. War is when your government tells you who the enemy is. Revolution is when you figure it out for yourself. Vatican endorses military force against ISIS. This is an RT article, and the Vatican has to, uh, um, has to approve all of that kind of stuff. And so they did. <laughs> when liberty and freedom are at stake, your silence isn't golden. It's yellow. Conspiracy theorist, someone who questions the statements of known liars. We now live in a nation where doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, governments destroy freedom, and the press destroys information, religion destroys morals, and our banks destroy the economy. The Treaty of Hidalgo does not end martial law. Therefore, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, Nevada are, are all under a military occupation to this day. Texas, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Oklahoma, Colorado, Wyoming, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Kansas, and Alabama are all under a military occupation to this day. Copies of these documents can be found in my private group at Yahoo called Administering Your Public Servants. I have uh, YouTube videos that are videos of private information shares that show these and other court citations that are available for a donation. Donations to support this work are appreciated. Um, and this last paragraph here is actually for all the Satanist order follower revenue officers operating in their private capacity, I might add, and I might stress. Um, because they can take their privileges and benefits and put them up their rectal orifice. I prefer a gold or silver coin, but as an extremely less desirable alternative, I can accept their IOUs, their commercial paper, Federal Reserve notes, PayPal gifts, checks, money orders, etc. Send me an email for particulars. Send me an email for other copies of documents to engineerwin at yahoo.com. I appreciate you taking the time to watch the video. I hope you get something out of it and uh, spread the word. You've got all sorts of reasons here why your rights are being violated and why you can bring an action against these Satanists.